Thank you for joining us on this live video Q&A for Greater Good Science Center's The Science of Happiness course for the fall of 2017. Uh, this is going to be a wonderful conversation between myself, I am Emiliana Simon-Thomas, the Science Director at The Greater Good, and also a co-instructor for the Science of Happiness course, and three other very special guests. One of them is Beverly Rivard, who is a three-time community teaching assistant for the course. She joins us from Alaska. We have Christine Cashman, who is a community teaching assistant from this session and uh, is, is taking the time to join us and, and participate in the conversation. And then finally, our special guest, Iris Moss, who is a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley. Iris has a celebrated academic career contributing to our general understanding of human emotional experience and resilience and mental well-being and health and um, has published hundreds of articles in this space, has mentored very promising young students in this space for 10 years, many who've moved on to have uh, positions at top tier prestigious universities. She speaks all over the world. This year she spoke at the World Economic Forum in Davos and um, she's also just a really delightful person to interact with and uh, contributes in, in really important ways to the Greater Good Science Center and to UC Berkeley. So Iris, it's such a joy to have you. Thank you for taking the time to uh, participate in the Science of Happiness with us. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Excellent. All right, well, I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, we got a ton of questions for us from students from all over the world uh, in the edX platform that I compiled into a list, and um, we're going to do our best to address as many as we can. And the first one, which was really popular, had to do with really wondering about what happiness is. In other words, is happiness kind of a, a, a state or a, a characteristic or is it a process? Is it some kind of phenomenon that we pursue or approach over the lifespan? Over the lifespan? Um, specifically, you know, what is the pursuit of happiness and does it take work and how do we motivate ourselves to do it and, and why is it so difficult? So I know there's a lot in there, Iris, and I don't mean to overwhelm you with lots of different things at once, but how would you respond to that sort of series of, of questions? Yeah, so that is a whole bunch of questions all rolled into one. And I'll try to get to um, at least some of them. Um, and I think the first question you asked is really foundational to understanding um, the second set of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the question of what happiness is. Um, and I understand that you have um, come to some understanding in the first week of the course of how you want to operationalize or define happiness mm -hmm. as um, people, of course, uh, across the millennia have debated hotly about what happiness is. And I think there are many different defensible mm -hmm. understandings of it. And I happen to like the definition or conceptualization that you take in this course of understanding happiness not so much as just an emotional, momentary, hedonic state, but as a larger um, way of leading your life that feels um, right, that feels good. And of course, there's a hedonic aspect to that, right? It feels good the way I lead my life, but that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if we understand happiness in that way, we can then ask, how can we pursue it? Um, and that I think is the question, um, perhaps in uh, not just this course, but in all of psychology yeah. and philosophy, <laughs> how do people, uh, um, get to that state of happiness. Um, and we'll tackle it in five minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I, I hope to at least um, offer some ways to approach that question and understand that question and further discuss it. And I think that if we ask, how can we pursue happiness? Is that even possible? Um, I think a lot of the research suggests that um, say research by um, Barbara Fredrickson, who you'll hear of, and Sonia Lubomirsky, and uh, Kristen Leyes and others, suggests that 
yes, humans are able to transform their lives from a less happy state to a more happy state. And that's a really basic statement, but I think it's fundamental, um, meaning that there's hope for all of us <laughs> to increase happiness. And, um, and but I think the one person asked, why does it seem so difficult? Yeah, and how do we, <laughs> and how do we keep our is, motivation up? Exactly, exactly. Right. And why do how we get do, it wrong? How, why does it seem so hard? And I think that while some of the psychological research I mentioned is hopeful, some other research also suggests that there are, it's not that easy and there are many different pitfalls and you have to be careful about how you pursue it, um, lest you don't achieve it or you even end up with less happiness and more unhappiness. Um, there's a, a quote that I like by Eric Hoffer that uh, goes like, the search for happiness is one of the chief sources of unhappiness. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that's also true because there are, you have to get it just right. There's a question of dosage. Um, there's a question of the type of happiness activities. There's a question of fitting uh, the happiness activity um, to the kind of person you are, fitting it to the kind of context you're in. And I also think that we don't want to be um, too individualistic. I think a lot of our approaches to trying to make ourselves and others happier very much focus on the person and almost put too much onus mm -hmm. on the individual. Um, ignoring that many people are in circumstances that um, simply don't um, allow them to go about these happiness-inducing um, activities. So just right from the get-go, I want to position this a little bit in the larger, in thinking about not just individuals, but thinking about them in a larger context. Um, and. Um, thinking about how we don't meet just individual approaches, but structural and systemic approaches when we want to help a greater number of people be happier. Yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely uh, critical and probably one of the, well, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll ask you that question. It seems like that's one of the younger aspects of happiness science. And we understand, as you articulated, quite a bit about what we can do in our own lives and in our own minds and how we can engage in certain ac activities or exercises or uh, behaviors day in and day out that might change our own happiness. But in order to um, shift happiness at a broader level, at a population level. There are some other opportunities that we're, I feel like we're just learning about with things like the World Happiness Report um, and other, other efforts to understand the systemic and structural aspects of, of, of human happiness. Um, of course, as you know, in the class, we spend a lot of time trying to emphasize the interpersonal uh, sort of uh, relational aspects of, 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 of human happiness. And we'll talk about that more in this conversation. Um, so I'll dig in a little bit deeper about perhaps one of the pitfalls that I think many of us are susceptible to in thinking about how to pursue happiness. Um, and, and this is partly, in my view, a result of popular media and the kinds of um, stories that we, we, we hear from advertisers about what produces happiness or what's mm -hmm. most likely to foster happiness. And that is this notion that somehow happiness means never feeling bad. Happiness means never having any negative emotions like anger, or anxiety, or sadness. And what do you think about the importance or, or the role? What's the role that, that negative emotions like anger, anxiety, and sadness play in human happiness? Yeah, so I love that question. And um, for a while, my own research just focused on um, positive emotions. Mm -hmm. um, when I tried to understand how people pursue happiness, mm -hmm. um, 
I looked at um, essentially people pursuing positive emotions to too strong of a degree mm -hmm. and how that could backfire. Mm -hmm. But um, over time, that has shifted, um, and I completely agree with you because um, it seemed to be the case that more and more we found that actually in happiness, it really matters how you relate to your own negative emotions. So negative emotions really come to the fore. And what we and others have found is that really interestingly, um, that mindset of being afraid of or pushing away or avoiding negative emotions like sadness, anger, anxiety is actually associated with greater unhappiness. Um, and um, there seems to be even something paradoxical about that in that we and others have found that people who accept their negative emotions are actually more likely to feel better momentarily mm -hmm. and also to say that they have a happy life in the longer term. Mm -hmm. And what we think is going on is that, for one, if you accept your negative feelings, it sort of helps you to cycle through them to work through them more quickly mm -hmm. paradoxically right it's the moment you say I'm feeling bad and that's okay I don't have to do anything about that mm -hmm. it sort of allows the rest of your mind to disengage from that negative state a little bit mm -hmm. but I think the other piece is that to feel happiness in the sort of bigger sense in which you define it in this class, I think you have to integrate not just positive feelings, but also momentary negative emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some really interesting recent research um, by Jordi Kortbach and June Gruber on the notion of emotion diversity. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that uh, the, the uh, the happiest people are those who don't experience just positive emotions, but actually it's those who experience a wide range of emotions, including negative ones. So I think that to the degree that we see those messages in the media of just, oh, we all want to be laughing all the time um, to be happy and to have a good life. I think that's, you're exactly right. The research suggests that that's actually not the right way to go about it. Yeah. And maybe it's even counterproductive. So one of the other pieces that Dacker and I introduce in the course, and I'll just reiterate here, is the social function of these, uh, what some might call negative states, but some might call difficult states. Um, expressions of sadness inherently um, invite or attract your, your trusting, supportive other people to approach you and give you support. And having that sense of social support and trust is very, very important to your happiness. Experiences of anger are un un unavoidable consequences of, of change, right? There's always going to be somebody who doesn't want a change to happen, yet humans are constantly evolving their technology, their lifestyle, their civilizations in, in ways that, that, are, that are debatable. And so anger is part of that conflictual experience and using anger to advocate for justice or to address something that feels unfair is a really important kind of emotional signal that has a social consequence. Um, and there's plenty of interesting uh, research on stress. Chronic stress, not such a good thing for happiness. Adaptive stress in response to real threats, to moments of profound challenge, a really important part of how to function in the world and actually contributing to happiness in meaningful ways. So we do that. Now, Beverly, 
I realize we kind of covered uh, a question that, that I know you wanted to ask about uh, whether it was valuable or helpful to be able to or to be good at stifling negative emotions. Since we kind of dealt with that, I, I think Iris's answer really suggests that actually it does not help happiness. I'll add that it also makes your cardiovascular system not work as well. It, it suppresses your immune system to chronically sort of hold down or stifle these kinds of negative states, so not a good thing. Um, but the next question I think is um, relevant and a good follow-up. And so Beverly, do you wanna, you wanna go ahead sure. and, and start sure. that one? I think I'll just lead into that though with a comment from the last question on negative emotions mm -hmm. uh, because they're connected. Uh, one of the people who wrote in asking about is it valuable to stifle or avoid um, negative emotions mentioned the idea of uh, emotional regulation and managing behaviors related to negative emotions, mm -hmm. which happens a lot in schools. And so this mom was wondering, is it helpful to have these kind of programs in school that are kind of trying to program out these negative emotions or at least help kids find ways so that they're not experiencing them and therefore not creating behavior problems. So that's that's still left over from the last question. But uh, leading into how do we how do we help other people to cultivate happiness? So whether that's our children or in the workplace or with our the people that we come in contact with in the community. How do we become authentic enough and maybe happy enough ourselves or stable enough in our happiness to really help other people to cultivate happiness in their lives? All right. So and I think the two pieces are connected, right? Your, your question, how do we help children regulate their negative emotions um, and then other people more generally? And I think it's a, it's a great point that you're raising. Um, in the previous question, we talked all about how great negative emotions yeah. are. And of course, <laughs> we're not saying, oh, you should be raging all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's been understood uh, since uh, a long time ago that it's not real. It's not about just all emotions are good. Um, as Aristotle said, it's very easy to be angry, yeah. right? Um, but it's... Um, uh, what's difficult and what's so important is to be angry to the right degree with the right person in the right context mm -hmm. and um, with the right purpose. And so I just wanted to highlight that we're not saying, oh, you should just let your negative emotions hang out, go all over the place. And what, especially with regard to children, right, I think um, children have difficulty very clearly regulating their emotions, uh, including negative ones. Um, and we do need to, we can't just give them the message, it's good to be angry. But I think what's interesting, again, and it goes back to that paradox of teaching children that their negative emotions are okay, actually has a way of to also help them become better emotion regulators. Um, and um, what I talked about earlier, this finding that acceptance, emotionally acceptance, helps people themselves with their emotions. Um, we and others have found um, that it also helps when we relate to our own children. Um, so, um, for example, um, my graduate student asked parents um, of young children to what degree they believe that young children can control their emotions. And there were some parents who very realistically said, uh, no, they can't. They're three-year-old children, um, and so I have the expectation that my child will have negative emotions, mm -hmm. and I'll work with that. Mm -hmm. But some parents believe that three-year-old children have the capacity mm -hmm. to regulate their negative emotions, erroneously so, and those parents actually were the ones who responded with um, uh, in more punitive and less supportive ways to their children's negative emotions. And um, we believe that that might actually set in motion a um, vicious cycle because in turn that will 
um, not support um, the development of healthy emotion regulation in children. So um, I wanted to comment briefly on this idea of how do we help children regulate their negative emotions and somewhat paradoxically it comes back to that idea that if we accept them these negative emotions that might help enhance regulation and so you also asked more generally how can we help those around us um, become happier regulate their emotions mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really really interesting um, question and one piece in there that I find interesting or particularly interesting is that I think we've all encountered people who have um, try to help us be happy or to say something really bad happened and someone will, our, a really dear friend will come along and say, oh, it's, it's not that bad, just cheer up, yeah, something along right. those lines. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that that actually doesn't help us. Um, it might actually make us feel more isolated, feel invalidated, feel more sad. So when we said earlier, it's really hard to help ourselves feel happier. I think it's even harder to help other people feel happier. I do too. I think so too. You agree with yeah. that? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So and so, the research I think says that you you have to go about it in a really um, uh, indirect, uh, sneaky way. Um, <laughs> what seems to be one of the themes in this research is that the less the other person notices that you're trying to make them happier, the better it'll work. Hmm. So this invisible huh. idea of invisible social support or invisible um, help. So is it more like being a role model for happiness then? Like, like presenting it so that people can witness it, do you think? <laughs> I don't know. That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of drawing a blank on the research on that. It might be an unexplored question. Hmm. Um, and I guess you could hypothesize about it, right? Given what I just said, perhaps that's actually a really good way of going about it because it is invisible. You're not sort of directly, ham-fistedly telling your friend, just to cheer up. Mm -hmm. But I also wonder, because I think that one of the keys that we know from emerging research on interpersonal emotion regulation um, by uh, Jamil Zaki and Oliver John here at Berkeley is that, again, it's one p big piece is this idea of feeling seen and feeling accepted. And so maybe we're back to the idea of accepting a diversity of experiences and um, that accepting my friend's negative emotions, her distress might actually be the best route to helping her feel happier yeah. compared to just trying to combat mm -hmm. the negative. Yeah. So it sounds like the same uh, principles that we can apply to ourselves around our negative emotions, which is embrace them, understand the value that they present to us in our decision matrix or social interactions moving forward, use that in a fairly graceful and short-lived way, right? We don't want to mm -hmm sort of ruminate and escalate and spiral in these negative emotional states for lengthy periods. Um, that's obviously not healthy. Um, and, and again, that, that, that's the same kind of approach that works with others. We shouldn't go to others and try to 
encourage them to stifle their negative experiences or to somehow invalidate them by, you know, trying to solve it really quick, the quick fix, right? It's another right. kind of popular message. Let's just fix this right now by just pretending it didn't even happen and put something on top that, that we like. Um, actually, there's something valuable about the signal that comes from these negative emotions. And as a, as a supportive person, it, it, it's, it's more productive to acknowledge and honor that than to just sort of try to twist it into a different kind of experience. So that's so interesting. Um, it, so the next question is, is, is related, and um, I wonder how you think about this expectations. And, and it's related because sometimes we do walk around expecting to have our needs met quickly, to experience positive states, to walk around in a cheerful and everybody likes us kind of way. And I wonder what you think about, I mean, I guess maybe it's not gonna be a hard one to answer. What are, what are expectations? <laughs> what role do they play in happiness? <laughs> Actually, it's, it's a lot trickier to answer oh, good. than one might think. Um, I think that it, because when I went into this, this line of research, I thought that more expectations are just going to be straight up bad. Uh -huh. Because the more you expect, the more likely you're going to be disappointed. Sure. And that's just incompatible with feeling happy, right? If you're disappointed, you can at the same time be happy. Mm -hmm. But, um, it turns out that if you look carefully, that really seems to be only the case at the most extremes. And so um, if you, um, as you described, expect to be happy all the time and to a really high degree, that seems to backfire, if you will, and actually make you more discontent. So you want to avoid that. But we don't want to then say, don't expect to be, have no expectations, um, which is what some philosophies would prescribe, right? Um, and at least the empirical research in um, North American participants suggests that that doesn't seem to quite fit. Mm -hmm. um, so some expectation, <clears throat> some modest um, and um, context specific and sensitive context sensitive pursuit of happiness and expectation for happiness is actually okay mm -hmm. because it generates people doing the right things mm -hmm. um, at least that's the thinking so um, I think you either have read or will read um, Lana Catalino's mm -hmm. um, a prioritizing happiness paper and I think that's a really nice example of exactly that process where if you expect happiness to come about from some smart mm -hmm. um, well thought through daily activities um, and you don't expect <laughs> sort of life shattering earth yeah. shattering happiness but you know some modest, realistic expectations, that seems to be good for people. Oh, that's so helpful. So, it, it's, yeah, it, sorry, it wasn't quite as... <laughs> no, I, it made a lot of sense to me, and I'm really glad you brought that clarity to it. And it, it we will actually also talk about um, sort of mental habits and goals that uh, relate to happiness a little bit later in the course. So we can all look forward to that. But, but your explanation was wildly helpful and kind of laying out that space of complexity where often the case seems to be that most things have some middle road functionality that's adaptive and an extreme in one direction expecting to be happy all the time and everything to work perfectly well is probably going to get in the way or having the opposite kind of expectation where nothing's ever going to work and you're always going to be a failure can really get in the way and sort of having a healthy level of expectation that is realistic um, can actually be part of your goals that, that drive a pursuit, a healthy pursuit of happiness. Um, you brought up the idea of culture. So Christine, I was wondering if you felt like bringing up um, question number 10 that we have on our, on our list. Christine? Sure. Um, what is the state of knowledge about culture and happiness and how well does the science represent different cultural perspectives? 
That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, th feel free to just answer the parts that really, you know, align with the studies that you've done or that you've been involved in or that, that are in your comfort zone. I mean, it's a huge question and this yeah. happens all the time, but, you know, we'll, we'll just share as much as we know. It's a, it's a really great question and I think it's incredibly important that we sort of started to touch on it implicitly in the previous answer, right, where I sort of uh, qualified my answer by saying that at least in North American participants. And so the first answer to your question is that it's a great question and we should never assume that what we find in, say, young North, North American women will apply to other contexts. So it's really important for us to constantly ask that question, what role does culture play Especially when we're talking about something that's as strongly culturally embedded as happiness. And it goes back to the very beginning of this conversation, right, where we said, oh, wait, there's many different understandings of um, happiness. And um, cultures, of course, vary vastly in how they understand happiness. And then by extension, the best ways to pursue happiness are going to vary vastly across different cultures. And I want to just emphasize that I'm talking about culture um, in, um, in, a, so in the broad sense, not just sort of say um, Asians versus Europeans, um, but really even within countries. So socioeconomic status is uh, uh, a way of um, basically being in different socio-cultural contexts. Gender can be thought of as um, a cultural variable. Um, age can be thought of as a cultural variable in the sense that um, our ideas and practices vary along the lines of those factors. So um, to then address your question, there's um, a couple of um, I think that the research on happiness has not done nearly as exhaustive a job at understanding how culture and happiness mm -hmm. um, relate to one another. Um, but there's um, a few lines of research that I can think of that seem really interesting and relevant. So one line of research is um, by uh, Shige Oishi, um, uh, at the University of Virginia, and he's done these incredibly interesting analyses, um, historical analyses of um, how different um, cultures across history have defined happiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the really interesting things he's found is that the understanding that you have individual control over your own happiness is a relatively specific and relatively recent understanding um, in um, essentially North American context. Um, many other cultures understand happiness as something that's unbidden. If you're lucky, you have it, but you certainly in those cultures wouldn't sort of set out to make yourself happier and you wouldn't be held accountable for being unhappy, that's the flip side of it. Mm -hmm. So that's one really interesting line of research with huge implications for um, our understanding and pursuit of happiness. And then another line of research is um, uh, by Jeannie Tsai at Stanford University and she and her lab um, have documented um, that um, different people understand this emotional ingredient of happiness in different ways mm -hmm. where european americans um, tend to think of that emotional piece as a more what Jeannie Tsai calls high arousal um, state um, so we think that the best thing is to be excited mm -hmm. um, enthusiastic um, and so forth. But when you go to, um, uh, say, uh, East Asia, or even ask Asian Americans who reside in the US, 
they have a different understanding of what the ideal emotion is mm -hmm. that is most conducive to happiness. They think of it more as a low arousal state, um, uh, something more like contentment and calm. Um, and so understanding that really basic individual and cultural difference, again, has big implications for how we um, pursue happiness and how we um, understand the influence of culture on it. Did that answer your question? Yes, I think that's great. Yeah, um, one other space where the opportunity is remarkable for, for bringing more understanding to this question has to do with an earlier topic that we touched on, which is happiness fit. So one thing that happens in the course, Iris, is that each week we encourage students to try what we call a happiness practice. So three good things is what they were encouraged to try in the first week. And this is sort of an, an exercise in optimism and really reflecting on what is um, positive in your day in and day out life. Um, and the, 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 the area that I'm thinking of is there is in all great likelihood variability in how effective or productive these different little happiness practices that we've drawn from empirical studies will be in different cultures. Um, I remember a study about gratitude practice working really differently in your kind of Western um, your European audience versus uh, a more Eastern um, population and, and, and specifically that in, in the Korean subsample the gratitude practice was didn't have as much of an impact and I, I believe that the interpretation was that there was a ceiling effect that gratitude was really not something that they were deficient in whereas in the US we know from a couple different sources that we all think that we're grateful and we all think that our gratitude is getting bigger and bigger but we think that society as a whole is getting less and less grateful and that other people are getting less and less grateful which basically is impossible, right, mathematically and statistically, and suggests perhaps that we're just pretty out of practice at making other people sort of appreciate the fact or, or at least feel our gratitude. Like we don't think anybody else is gra grateful because they're not saying it to us or they're not expressing it in our direction. And so we're not, we're not experiencing it that way. So yeah, again, there's this happiness practice or exercise or behavior by culture space that I'm really excited to sort of see more and more research uh, reveal some insights from. Absolutely. And I think probably the students of this course can, can pick up on that as they try out these exercises, many of which have been developed in Western contexts. Exactly. Um, and there's an individual fit too, right? Um, mm -hmm. So say, uh, the, the introverted person might not be up for uh, speaking for myself. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, random acts of kindness. And sure. I think that's great, but it's harder. I would have to admit that would be really difficult for me to walk up to a stranger. Uh, sure. So I think there's an individual fit of the activities too. Absolutely. That question comes up every time we run the course the question about well how does this all stuff all how does all this stuff apply to the introvert and um, while we're not going to get deep into the reads of that question, I will direct anyone to the video Q&A that happened a couple sessions ago with Sonia Lubomirsky. She provides a really thoughtful answer to that question, really based on the fact that what we think happens is that there, in terms of the exercises that are interpersonal that sort of cultivate or bolster your, your sense of trust and safety and your tendency towards pro-social behaviors, that works just as well for the introvert as it does for the extrovert. And it's not a question of quantity, it's a question of quality. So I think a lot of times people feel like, oh, I have to do this with 500 people or I have to do, you know, meet 10 different people and be really funny and charming and kind and generous. Really, um, it's not about quantity again. It's really, can you engage with at least one other person and in some contexts yourself in a kind and nurturing way. So 
That said, Beverly, I was wondering if you wanted to ask Iris um, about question number 14, um, if, it, if you've got it in front of you since she it I came up. I do, just yeah. a second. Yep. <clears throat> so this question is about aging. Um, I, it's been relevant in, in my life and my practice that um, I've run into doctors when I'm working with elders who say that, you know, just uh, being depressed, for example, is a factor of aging. And I think that in the United States, at least, we have a lot, we lend a lot of credence to that of like, oh, yes, you shouldn't get old because then you'll be just like unhappy and doing nothing. And, you know, it's, it's not accurate at all, but it's, but it's one of those myths, I think, of aging. And so this question is about how do, how do aging and happiness interact? How does aging affect happiness? And uh, how do we work with that? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And um, there is, um, again, the beginnings of an outline of understanding how that works. And um, the research that we have so far completely agrees with your idea um, that it's the exact opposite of what this doctor um, told you. In fact, um, there's a very robust um, positive relationship between aging and uh, many different indices of happiness. Um, so uh, Laura Karstensen over at Stanford University um, is probably one of the main um, researchers in that area. And she's um, even called it um, the positivity effect of aging because mm -hmm. there is a strong um, uh, positive link between getting older um, and um, experiencing greater uh, levels of positive emotion. Um, also somewhat lower levels of negative emotion um, and also a greater sense of well-being and happiness. And so um, the big question is how do older people do this and can we learn from <laughs> yeah. them? Right? And so I think there's, it's really unfortunate that there still is this false understanding that when you age you're just going to be miserable because it impedes our society's openness to learning from older people. I think we have a lot to learn from them in terms of how do they do it? Because I think it is undeniable that as you age, you experience more hardship, right? It's just a logic. Well, more time on planet, you experience more bad things. Um, and uh, your friends start to die, your uh, friends, you yourself become sick and so forth. Um, and so what seems to be the case is that older people are really good, or I should say on average, better than younger people at uh, essentially taking um, stressful, bad situations and transforming them into situations that um, are uh, uh, that they that they can be resilient to situations that are okay uh, and sometimes even experience that post-stress growth um, mm -hmm. so taking something really difficult and making it into something that um, uh, uh, brings you closer to loved ones um, turning it into something that adds meaning um, to your life, uh, that adds richness to your life, uh, perhaps going back to the idea of emotion diversity. Um, so, um, and how exactly older people do this, sort of this mental trick of transforming uh, bad situations into something that's bearable and maybe even um, uh, take growth from it, I think that's not really exactly understood. Um, but it goes back to, in part, to the ability to regulate emotions, I think. Um, and one thing that we've shown is that um, older people have a greater tendency to accept negative emotions compared to younger people. So there's acceptance again. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and they also uh, seem to have a better capacity at um, uh, relating to other people um, and so and perhaps accepting other people for who they are um, so the while the quantity of relationship decreases with age the quality of relationships seems to increase with age and so it goes back to the situated interpersonal aspect of happiness and so maybe these are two elements that older people um, use uh, to uh, to achieve that greater sense of happiness compared to younger people when controlling for um, uh, differences in uh, life experiences. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a big word for that is, of course, wisdom. And so <laughs> we don't know whether uh, that is what wisdom is, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think that it's, one element of the uh, big, uh, lofty construct of wisdom. There's a whole area of research, right? Like, what is wisdom, and and how does that relate to happiness? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That was such a useful answer for another set of questions that I'm just going to acknowledge, although I, I, I will maybe leave it to listeners and the people who posted it to draw the connections. Several people, including someone from Florida, posted this question about how do I kind of maintain my pursuit of happiness or my happiness levels in the face of catastrophic, very um, crisis, serious crisis types of events. And uh, maybe, maybe some of the kind of answers to that question lie in exactly what you were just saying, Iris, about trying to understand how the older adult population manages their own life and their experiences that are inevitably difficult and, and in some regards tragic when they lose close others, they're still increasing or at least maintaining and if not increasing their happiness. There was a, a, a fairly robust review of happiness levels over the lifespan recently that looked at internationally and basically showed that wherever the, the researchers measured this, it was a U-shaped curve. In other words, happiness at around 18 to 20 was at a certain level. Um, through the 30s and 50s, it went down a little bit and after 50 and, and forward, it, it tended to you know gradually increase back up. And there was variance in when the increase happened that was related to different countries and different cultures and um, that's a very interesting and provocative little question mm. but again do you have anything to add to like what to do when you perhaps and and I can relate to this feel hopeless both as a result of perhaps a personal devastating experience or what you're witnessing going on in the world around you how can we kind of stay positive for lack of better expression yeah yeah so that question really resonates with me because i think that sometimes it almost seems callous to talk about there's different way facets of what resonates with me and i don't have a super clear handle on it but one piece I think is that it seems almost callous to say to somebody or to implicitly say to somebody uh, who's just lost all their belongings uh, or uh, or lost a loved one um, just try to stay positive mm -hmm. and I think we just want to be very clear that's actually not what we're saying mm -hmm. um, and um, there's also an element of sort of like first world problems here, right? Like, yeah. are we talking about people who have everything and then sort of we're trying to make them even happier? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that those are really big questions that we need to grapple with mm -hmm. as a field. And I think that that that's not the goal of the field of happiness. And I so love that your center is called the greater good center, not the sort of happiness yeah. for the 
fortunate few center, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, but at the same time, I think we don't want to cop out and say, as psychologists, if you are in these really dire circumstances, um, I can't help you as a psychologist. We just need to change all of society to prevent those dire circumstances. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we can't, right? We can't take all the pain and the painful circumstances away. And so I think it's important to though keep that in mind and really look at it and in a non-callous way, think about how even the most dire of circumstances might be such that even someone who's pressed from all sides and who has every right to feel hopeless can perhaps look at the situation in a way that helps them gain some some hope and some measure of um, um, positivity for lack of a better word yeah. and it, it, I go back to uh, sort of Victor Frankl right mm -hmm saying that who just experienced the the most horrendous circumstances and had I think every right in the world to give up and feel completely hopeless mm -hmm. and yet who transformed that situation for himself into one of hope and strength mm -hmm. and a big part again I think lies in not denying that this is horrendous, right? Not denying the reality and not having unrealistic expectations. If, you're, if your house just got blown away, you should feel devastated. You have every right to feel devastated and don't put, you know, put, a, put responsibility on yourself to feel happy in that moment. I think that goes back to the unreasonable pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. And remember, it's about reaching out to other people, uh, about human connection that might um, uh, help you in the longer term regain happiness. Um, Another line of research that comes to mind in that context is uh, by Judy Moskowitz, and she um, did research on um, uh, partners of uh, people dying from AIDS. Um, and she, and I always think of her research because again, it's, it's the most heart-wrenching of circumstances, right? You lose your partner before their time and what she found is that, and yet, there were, there were lots of negative emotions, of course, but also some positive ones. And the people who experienced those positive emotions in that horrible situation, they were the ones who went on to be happier in the long term. And so at first glance, you might think, oh, that sounds horrible, right? What are you talking about? But it's sort of positive emotions like appreciation and love mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and humor even. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. It reminds me also of the data that relates humor in relationships to um, continued in trust and longevity uh, in partnerships where even in the face of conflict, if couples can sometimes see the humor in the moment, that can be something that really gives them strength. Um, we've got about five minutes left. And in that five minutes, I wanna respond to a real-time question. and. Um, uh, if science has found that the pursuit of happiness does not lead to happiness, which I actually don't think is a true statement. I don't think that's what we've been trying to say. So maybe the answer will be just clarifying that. Um, the, the, the next part is why does academia continue to use this language? Um, I don't think science has found that the pursuit of happiness is not effective. It's simply that if you define happiness as always feeling positive and enthusiastic and always having your needs met and, and always being cheerful and never experiencing anything difficult or never failing, 
then it doesn't work. And so we spend a lot of time very carefully, in, both in the course and as scientists, trying to define happiness in a way that is actually valuable to people. And again, pursuing happiness as defined the way Iris did earlier in this hour and the way that we do in the course um, is actually very promising and potentially productive for people. Okay, in the last four minutes, I wanna um, invite Christine to ask, speaking of first world problems, um, uh, question number seven, if you can find that question one. Question number seven, mm -hmm. okay. Um, how can you prioritize happiness when your schedule is hectic? Asked by a mom, working mom who used to meditate, would like to do more community service and has trouble finding time. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you don't even know how much that question resonates. Right? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, um, I wish I had the answer to that. Um, <laughs> one answer is that, um, and I think that perhaps um, Sonia Lubomirsky talks about that, that um, you don't have to do and you said this earlier um in Indiana as well you don't have to do huge you don't have to give huge chunks of your time you don't have to do an hour-long meditation every day um to um uh to get some good um outcomes um and so i think that if we are if our life is such that we simply cannot um, do anything or we have to work with what we got. Um, and um, uh, the research does suggest that even relatively simple, relatively small um, daily practices can um, help us um, feel happier. Um, but I also, I realize that sometimes our lives are such that even that doesn't seem possible. Um, and so I think we got to be realistic and at the end of the day say, maybe that's okay. Then maybe we just have a few years in our lives where we were not happy mm -hmm. and maybe that should be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. And I also love the, the suggestion that it, we don't have to carve out, again, a huge, very different approach to our day in and day out life to, you know, gradually ratchet up the, the, the strengths that we know are tied to happiness. Sometimes it's as simple as really noticing whether you're paying attention to what you're doing in the moment versus ruminating about some prior experience or imagining some future thing that is not relevant to what's happening right now. Um, we'll talk a lot more about that kind of awareness in week five on mindfulness. Sometimes it's just taking a deep cleansing breath, cleansing being not a scientific word, but deep being <laughs> scientific, <laughs> breathing in and breathing out more slowly than you breathe in when you do feel that kind of tension start to come into your shoulders or perhaps your teeth clench about something that's frustrating that's happening in your day in and day out life. Often it's about just little brief ways that you can connect in a more trusting and generous way. And I don't mean giving away your things or investing in money or, 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 or contributing to charity necessarily. I simply mean being open-hearted and grateful and kind to others when you have the choice to do so. These kinds of little steps towards building up what we call social capital, the trust, the connections that you have day in and day out is very important to the sort of building blocks of your happiness. So it doesn't have to be dramatic and huge. Um, and yes, I totally sympathize with the question and sometimes just have to go, yep, this is busy. <laughs> yep, this is a stressful moment for me. And we also know scientifically that just naming how you're feeling even and particularly when it's a difficult feeling is something that's valuable to the recovery process in those moments. Okay, we're at five seconds. I wanna say thank you to Iris, 
taking the time to speak with us. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for the staff here who helped us make this video at uh, the Berkeley X video booth. And uh, thank you to all the students, wherever you are all around the world, for joining us and submitting your questions to this live Q&A uh, for the fall of 2017 Science of Happiness course.